Good afternoon, friends. It's a pleasure to be with you this afternoon on this special day, this Mother's Day. And uh, like those before, I would like to congratulate all mothers here and wish you all the very best, not just for today, but for this coming year and beyond. Uh, we've got an, an important an interesting subject to cover this afternoon. But before we do so, I'd like to just take a moment to remind you that our series continues. We've got some truly fascinating subjects that we are going to continue to look at together. Now, our next program is on Saturday. Uh, it's at UTS, but not this theatre. We have a, another theatre that we are going to be uh, moving to next Saturday, and then we will be remaining in that theatre for the remainder of our, our little series together. So one more transition to make. I'm sure you can, you can manage that. You'll find out where the, the, uh, the, the address and the details, there's a, a map with the information that will be available as you leave this afternoon. So uh, more fascinating programs still to come, but today's is a very important one. Uh, as was mentioned, as Brian mentioned, we are going to look at this whole issue of pain and suffering. You know, there's probably no more important subject when it comes to understanding God, and there probably isn't another subject that turns people off Christianity than the idea that, look, you Christians say that your God is all-powerful. Is that correct? And we say, yes. You Christians say that your God is love. Is that correct? Yes then why does this all-powerful God, who is love, allow my mother to suffer from cancer? It's a good question, isn't it? And how do we respond? Well, friends, today we are going to look at the Bible answer to this question in our program, Does God Care? As we open the Bible together, I'm going to invite you just to bow your heads and we'll invite the presence of the God of this Bible to be with us. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that there is a God in heaven who is love and who shares vital information with us in his word, in his book, the Bible. And as we open the word of God together this afternoon to study this most important of subjects, I pray that your presence will be here with us, that you will guide and direct in all that is said and done. And Lord, give us wisdom and understanding, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. This particular Friday, May 21, 1976, dawned like just any other day. But it was a special day for the students of Yuba City High School, especially the school choir. Because this Friday, they were going to travel from Yuba City they were going to travel from Yuba City, where they were based, where they lived, and they were going to travel down to Miramonte School, where they were going to share a musical concert. And uh, you can see the distance that they, they had to travel. Here is San Francisco. And then they were going to spend the weekend sightseeing and having a, a holiday in the beautiful city of San Francisco. The bus they were traveling on was the old school bus that had been doing its job, its work, conscientiously and faithfully for 26 years. For 26 years, the old school bus had been transporting school students around Yuba City into their various excursions. The choir master decided to invite his wife to travel with them, and she was going to be the chaperone on the bus. He would drive in his own vehicle uh, ahead of the bus uh, to make sure that, that all was well. And so the bus was fairly, fairly full. There were about 40 students on the bus as they headed off uh, to present their special musical performance. 
and then to spend a, a wonderful weekend in San Francisco. As they were traveling along, the choir master noticed that uh, the, the uh, bus driver was asking him to, to slow down. And so he pulled over in a, in, a, uh, in, a, in a highway rest area. The bus pulled in behind him. And the bus driver said, look, we, we, we need to get some fuel. So uh, they decided that at the next exit, several miles in America or kilometers here in Australia, they would take the highway exit and they would pull into the, into the roadside uh, rest area there where there was a, a fuel stop uh, and they would fill up and then continue on, on their journey. And so they were back on the, on the highway again, making their way from, from, Yuba, from Yuba City down the, the highway here, making their way right down to their, to their destination. Uh, as they traveled, uh, the children, of course, were having a lot of fun. The choir master suggested, as they travel on the old school bus, that they not sing because he wanted them to arrive fresh and he didn't want them to, to wear their, their voices out before they, tie their voices out before they got there. As they came to make the turn off the, the highway, now the turn was a very sharp exit. And uh, as they came to make the turn, one of the students sitting near the bus driver noticed that as he put his foot on the brake, that uh, nothing much seemed to happen. So he noticed as he, he struck twice, three times, still nothing happened. You see, nobody realized that about just a few kilometers back, a little compressor seal that allowed air into the brake or controlled the air into the brake had broken. And so as the bus driver put his foot on the brake pedal, nothing happened. He was traveling about 60 kilometers an hour as he made the turn. He realized that he had no brakes, no compression, no brakes. And so he pulled on the handbrake, he pulled on the emergency brake, and as he did so, the wheels on the bus locked up. And the bus just went into a long skid, took out all the guardrail, and then flipped over the exit and fell more than 10 meters and landed on its roof. Well, the impact just crushed the roof of the bus and compacted it right down to seat level. It was a terrible, terrible accident. They... Yuba City bus crash saw 29 people killed. It was the deadliest bus accident in America. You can imagine the, the heartache, the devastation, the pain. 29 lives lost, including the choir master's wife who was a chaperone on that, on that bus. And there were investigations. They had a, a memorial service where the headmaster of the school spoke of the, the pain, the suffering that the, the school was experiencing, all the students, the parents, as a result of this, this catastrophe. The deadliest school bus accident in America. And they all came out to this great uh, large memorial service to pay their respects. And uh, one of the survivors on the bus was a student by the name of Tom Randolph. And he got up and he, he spoke about his fellow students, his friends, his fellow choir, uh, choir members who lost their lives on the bus. And he, and he expressed his pain and anguish. And then he made an interesting statement. And I want to share it with you. He said, our choir was the best. God must have wanted part of our choir. So he took them. So he took them. Is that what God is like? 
Is that what God is like? Does He go around grabbing teenagers, choir members, because He likes the way they sing? With all His myriads of angels who are noted for their, their wonderful music and singing, does He have to come and take our choirs from us? Is that what God is like? Well, back at Yuba City, they had a detailed investigation to try to find out the cause of this terrible accident that caused so much pain, so much suffering, and so much death. And they decided, amongst other things, that they would even tighten the, the bus laws more. They would tighten the bus driver laws they would redesign uh, the, uh, the, the off-ramps off the, off the highways. But you know, friends, as they did their investigation, they discovered that there was no driver error, that there was nothing significantly wrong with the, the old school bus, that the accident was caused by something as simple as a broken compressor belt that cost just a few dollars. Pain and suffering. How do we deal with it? How do we explain it? Who is responsible for it? You know, pain, suffering, death, it's something that, these are things that touch us, all of us, as human beings, sooner or later. And they are so hard for us to understand so difficult for us to cope with. And often we need to blame someone. We've got to put the responsibility somewhere. And God seems so convenient to blame, so handy. And so when tragedy strikes, we often say, God, why did you do this to me? Why did you allow this to happen? But is that fair? And more importantly, is it right? How should we understand pain, suffering, death? Because these are issues that affect everyone. It's interesting to note how different cultures, different religions deal with this issue around the world. You know, these are not just issues that we face here in Sydney. All humans face these same issues, pain, suffering, death. How do we deal with it? How do other cultures, how do other religions deal with it? As I say, all human societies have known suffering and, and evil. And so they've all had to come to grips with them in some way or another. They've all tried to find answers. And so today I thought it would be interesting to see how some of the, the great world religions have tried to grapple and, and cope with the big, massive issues of pain and suffering and death. Take the Hindu religion, for example. The Hindu religion was founded around 1,500 1, BC. It was founded in India, and today there are somewhere between 900 million and 1 billion adherents. So here's a, a massive group of people. Uh, it's the third largest of the, the religions of the world. And they have their own sacred writings, their own texts, the Vedas, the Sutras, the Upanishads, and, and so on. How do they explain this issue of pain and suffering and death? Well, in Hinduism, suffering is explained essentially as payback. And so every experience of suffering is understood, we know that term today, as karma. In terms of karma, the universal principle by which all actions of the past 
are balanced in the present. And so if a, if a young three-year-old gets cancer or some other disease or ailment, then it's explained by somebody in that family in the past acting improperly or misbehaving. And so this is a way of, of balancing the ledger, karma. Or if you walk past a leper who's begging on the, on the street, then you would say, well, in, his pa- in, in the past, he must have done something wrong to deserve this punishment. And so for Hinduism, why pain and suffering? Because it's deserved. The ledger is being balanced. You've done something or somebody in your family has done something wrong in the past, and so now the balance must be made. The way the Hindus, the Hindu religion, explains this issue of human suffering. What about Buddhism? Buddhism was founded around 500 BC, also in India, Today it has about 360 million uh, adherents. It's the fourth largest religion in the world. Uh, They have their own religious texts also. So how does Buddhism explain this issue of human suffering? Well, to a Buddhist, suffering is just an illusion. It's an illusion through which we must train ourselves to see. You see, our experience of suffering according to to Buddhism is ultimately related to our desire or our affection for things of this world. So notice carefully, suffering is related to desire. Related to desire. And so if I desire, for example, a full stomach then starvation will feel like suffering. Do you understand what I'm saying? If I desire love, then the death of my my wife will be a tragedy. If I desire wealth and uh, my bank goes bankrupt or my business goes bankrupt, then bankruptcy will be a disaster. So for Buddhism, when they have to explain and find an answer for suffering and pain, they are the direct result of our desires. And so what's the answer to pain and suffering? Remove the desire. If you are able to remove the desires, then all such suffering will end. What about Islam? Islam was founded in 622, was founded in Mecca by the Prophet Muhammad. Their adherents about 1.3 billion around the world. The second largest religion in the world. And of course, their sacred writings is the Quran. Now, how does Islam understand this issue of pain and suffering? Well, in Islam, all events in history are absolutely determined. Everything that happens is controlled by the will of Allah. So events which cause suffering, such as, for example, a a plane crash, a war, a deformed baby, are all the will of Allah. And so how does Islam explain suffering and pain? They are the will of Allah. We've looked at the, the big four, or... Several of them, three of the the big four religions of the world. What about atheists? How do they explain pain and suffering? Well, in atheism, suffering is just natural. 
Everything that happens in our world, whether good or bad, are the inevitable consequence of chance. There is no evil for an atheist. So if you experience an earthquake or rape or cancer, it's just luck, bad luck. It's all just a natural part of of being human. It's all due to chance. So there we have the way many of the inhabitants of our planet understand this issue of pain and suffering. In Hinduism, suffering is karma. It's payback. You deserve it. In Buddhism, suffering is caused by your desires. So get your desires under control and it will alleviate or solve the problem of suffering. For adherents of Islam, suffering is the will of Allah. For atheists, suffering is natural. It's caused by chance. Friends, today I wish to share with you why I believe the Christian explanation, the Bible explanation, the Bible's answer to the questions that arise concerning pain and suffering is the most logical and for me personally, the best explanation that there is. And so we are going to spend a little time seeing what the Bible has to say on this subject. And friends, we need to know what the Bible teaches on this subject, and we need to get it right. We need to discover who is ultimately responsible for all the pain and the suffering in our world. Is God really the one to blame? Is He really responsible for all the pain and the suffering we see around us? You know, we we often call uh, acts of nature when it comes to insurance policies, they're even called an act of God. Isn't that right? What caused this? What caused this problem with my house or, or this whatever it might be, flood, earthquake? Oh, it's an act of God. Really? Is that right? And more importantly, is it fair? Is God really responsible for all the pain and the suffering that we see in our world? Does God really go around causing bus accidents and grabbing teenagers because He likes the way they sing? Is that what God is really like? You know, friends, there's a very, a very simple way to find out what God is like. To find out if this is the sort of activity that God does engage in. If you want to find out what God is like, all you need do is look at Jesus Christ. Because, you know, Jesus Christ came to this earth to show us what God is like. And so if you want to find out whether this is the type of activity that God gets involved in, then just have a look at the sorts of things that Jesus did when he was here on this earth. Because Jesus says in John chapter 10 and verse 30, you'll notice he says here, I and my Father are what? Are the same, are one. That's correct. And then he says a little further over, he says a little further over in John chapter 17 and verse 5. Notice what he says here. Father, glorify me. Here is his prayer. Glorify me with the glory which I had with you before the world began. So before this world began, before Bethlehem, Jesus was with the Father. He says here just a few verse chapters back in John chapter 8 and verse 58, he says, Before Abraham was, I am. 
And then, of course, in chapter 1 of John, it says very clearly, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was what? Now, the Word is a reference to Jesus. So, friends, if you want to find out what God is like, then just read the historical record of what Jesus did when he was here on this planet. You know, the disciples came to Jesus one day. They're like us, the disciples. I I want you to notice what Philip said in John chapter 14 and verse 8, where Philip says, Philip said to him, Lord, show us who? Show us who? Show us the Father. We want to know what God is like. Show us the Father. And it is sufficient for us. I want you to notice Jesus' reply in the very next verse. Jesus said, don't you know me, Philip? Even after I've been among you such a long time, anyone who has seen me has seen who? Has seen the Father. And so Jesus came to show us what God is like. And so if you want to know what God is like, just look at Jesus. So let's take a look. Let's do just that. Let's do a little detective work, a little investigating this afternoon. If God's the one who causes all these disasters, then surely we ought to catch Jesus in the act just once. But you know, friends, when you follow the record of the life of Jesus, you find that he goes around healing the sick, giving sight to the blind, caring for the the children, raising them up to health and strength again, providing food for the hungry, looking after the needs of, of all those he met. In fact, it says that when Jesus came to a village and then left that village, when he left, there wasn't anyone sick in that village. And it wasn't just the physical pain and suffering that he dealt with. It was also the emotional. And so he finds a a woman that's been caught in adultery. A crime back there that uh, carried the death penalty. They would stone women caught in adultery. Isn't it amazing how it's always the women who suffer? You know, let me ask you, how many people, at least how many, are required for the act of adultery? How many? Two. (laughs) But we never find the guys in trouble. It's always the women. Anyway, this this poor unfortunate woman comes to Jesus. She's caught in adultery. What does Jesus say? Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Here this poor woman is carrying the the guilt, the burden of her mistake. Others want to kill her. They want to stone her. What does Jesus say? I don't condemn you. Yes, you've made a mistake. But let me remove the guilt from you. You go in peace. And don't do that anymore because it will only bring you sadness and heartache. That's what we find Jesus doing. Wherever he goes, he brings healing. Whether it's the blind, the lepers, the crippled. Wherever we find Jesus, he raises the dead back to life again. That's what you find Jesus. That's the historical record. The people who are with him. Jesus heals, he loves, he forgives. That's what Jesus was like. He cares. Now, my friends, if Jesus is like God, if Jesus is like God the Father, if to see Jesus is to see the Father, then he too cares. God cares. 
My friends, it's not God who causes pain and suffering. But if it's not God, then who is it? Who is it that is responsible for the pain and the suffering that you and I experience, that you and I see in our society, that you and I see in our world? Well, Jesus once told a story. We call it a parable. You know, Jesus often taught by telling stories. We call them parables. But basically a parable is a simple story that tells a much larger truth. And so people back in Jesus' day, just like us today, loved stories. And they understood things far better if they were told in a story form. Now you might say, but oh, we're so sophisticated here in the 21st century, you know. Let me tell you. Any movie tells what? A story. Epic stories. And Jesus told great truths in simple stories. And so the disciples were dealing with the same issue. Who's responsible for the, for the pain and the suffering that we see, that we experience? And so Jesus told a parable. It's found in the book of Matthew, the 13th chapter, and I want, to, I want to read it to you. He put another parable before them saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while his men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat, and then went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain, then the weeds appeared also. And the servants of the master of the house came and said to him, Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have weeds? He said to them, an enemy has done this. And so the servant said to him, then do you want us to, to, to gather them? That is the weeds? But he said, no, lest in gathering the weed, you root up the wheat along with them. Let them both grow until the harvest. And at harvest time, I will tell the reapers, gather the weeds first and bind them in bundles to be burned. But gather the wheat into my barn. So it's a simple story. It's a simple story. Here we have a landowner who comes and he sows good seed. But weeds appear. And the landowner's helpers, the servants, they're surprised. W what's going on here? And then the landowner tells his helpers that his enemy sowed these seeds, the weeds. And the helpers say, well, look, would you like us to pull up the weeds quickly here? And the landowner says, no, no, leave them there. Leave the weeds with the wheat until the harvest time. They must grow together until the harvest because if, if not, when you pull the weeds out, you might pull the wheat out as well. So he said the two must grow together until the harvest and then they will be separated. And so it's a very simple story, but Jesus wanted to make sure that they got what he was trying to teach them. And so he himself then gives the interpretation to the parable. Notice what he says. He answered the one who, he answered, the one who sows the seed is who? The son of man. Another name for Jesus. The field is what? The world. And the good seed is the sons of the kingdom. The weeds are the sons of the evil one. And the enemy who sowed them is who? He's the devil. The harvest is the close of the age, and the reapers are the angels. 
And then he goes on and he says, Just as the weeds are gathered and burned with fire, so it will be at the close of the age. And he says, The Son of Man will send his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all causes of sin and all lawbreakers and throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their Father. He who has ears... Let him hear. And so Jesus now tells us the meaning of his, of his parable about this, this farmer, this landowner who went out and sowed good seed. He was preparing his, for a crop. And so he plants his seed, he sows his seed. And then Jesus gives us the information to tell us exactly what it all means. He says the landowner is Jesus. The field represents the world. The good seed, the sons of the kingdom, the kingdom, or believers in Jesus, in other words. And the weeds are the sons of the evil one, or unbelievers, those who have rejected Jesus, who do not believe in him. Who is the enemy? The devil. And the harvest is the close of the age. Now remember what Jesus said. And remember the question that drew this parable from Jesus. And remember the question that the servants came and asked the master, the landowner. Remember the question? Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? If you did, how come there are weeds here? The real question that they were asking was this. Did you have something to do with the appearance of these weeds? Is this somehow you're doing? Are you somehow responsible for the weeds that we see growing? And do you remember the answer that Jesus gave? Who was responsible for the weeds? An enemy. Isn't that right? He says, an enemy has done this, and the enemy who sowed the seed is who? The enemy who sowed the seed is the devil. So Jesus is saying, yeah, no, it's not my doing. The pain and the suffering, it's not, it's not me. The evil that you see in the world, I'm not responsible for that. Someone else is responsible for sowing weeds. An enemy is responsible. And who is that enemy? The devil. The devil. And so, friends, as we study the Word of God, the Bible leaves us in no doubt as to who is responsible for the pain and the suffering that we see in our world. Friends, let me say again, the Bible leaves us in no doubt as to who is responsible for evil, for pain and suffering that we see in our world. Some of you may be familiar with the Bible book of Job. It's said that it's possibly the oldest book in the Bible. And it's interesting that in perhaps the oldest book of the Bible, it deals with this very same issue. Why? Because this is a question that has been around as long as humanity. Pain and suffering. Who's responsible for it? We want to know. Humans want to know. And so in the very oldest book, perhaps, of the Bible, we find this question being dealt with. Do you remember Job? Job was a businessman, and he was doing really well in life until a series of personal disasters struck him one after another. I mean, it's, it's hard to imagine a series of disasters like this striking one person in such a short period of time. You know, poor old Job, the successful businessman, life is going along very well and smoothly, and then all of a sudden disaster strikes. He loses his business. Well, what a disaster that would be on its own. He loses his livelihood. His business is gone. Then he's facing financial ruin. 
then it gets worse. His children are killed. He becomes a social disgrace. And as if that's not bad, uh, bad enough, then he loses his health. And finally we find him covered in boils from head to foot. Now, friends, if that happened to you, would you feel hard done by? Imagine a series of disasters, of calamities happening in your life such as this. And so Job's friends and his wife come to him and they say, Job, it's God who is responsible for all of this. They tell him that God is punishing him and and causing all this pain and all this suffering. But then, friends, the Bible pulls back the curtain and gives us an insight into what is going on behind the scenes. You know, you and I see the the evidence of all this, this disaster, this pain, this suffering. We don't see what's going on behind the scenes. But here, the Word of God in the book of Job pulls back the curtain and gives us an insight into a discussion that is going on as part of this great conflict between good and evil, between God and Satan. We're in a war zone, friends. And here we get an insight into into what's happening behind the curtain. And Satan comes to God and said, you know that Job down there? Well, he's only a goody-goody. He only serves you because you are so good to him. So Satan says that Job only serves God because God is good to Job. Because God protected him and blessed him. And so he says to God, go and take away all those blessings and then you will see that Job, who you think is your follower, he will curse you. He will reject you. Go on, take away your blessings. And so God allows Satan to go about his work. And there, disaster, pain, and suffering strike Job one after another. So God says, all right, take away. Take away all that he has then, if that's what you want to do. And so he loses his business. He's facing financial ruin. His children are killed. He becomes a social disgrace. But you know, friends, the amazing thing is this. Through it all, Job remains loyal to God. And then Satan comes back to God and he says, oh, well, you said I could take all his possessions and, 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 and so forth away, but you won't allow me to touch him. But I tell you what, if I were to touch him, if he were to experience pain and suffering, then you'll find that he will turn against you. Satan says if Job experiences pain, he will curse God and turn away from him. So notice what's happened. First, he loses his business. He experiences financial ruin. Then his children are killed. He becomes a social disgrace. And now Satan comes and says, let me at him. Let me give him some pain and some suffering. And so God says, if that's what you must do, go ahead then. And so Job loses his health. We find him covered in boils from head to toe. But you know, friends, through it all, Job says, though he slay me, yet will I serve him. He himself had a misunderstanding as to what was going on behind the scenes. So Satan comes to God, and I want you to notice what he says. He says, but now you, but now stretch out your hand. So Satan now comes to God and says, God, go on, you stretch out your hand. You touch all that he has, and he will surely curse you and die. Do you notice what Satan says to God? You do it, go on. But now stretch out whose hand? Your hand, Satan says. Go on, you touch him. You cause the pain and the suffering. Do you remember what God said to Satan? 
God said, all that he has is in whose power? Your power. And so here God points his finger at the true culprit of all pain and suffering. My friends, when it comes to pain and suffering, many of us have been misplacing the blame. It's not God that causes pain and suffering. It's the devil, Satan, who is responsible for all the pain and the suffering in our world. Now, when we deal with this issue of pain and suffering, there are a few things that we must keep in mind. There are a few things that we must recognize regarding this universe in which we live. Firstly, God's universe operates according to natural law. For example, if you look around you, you will see design, order, precision, and balance in our world. The sun rises every morning, and it sets every evening. We know about the laws of gravity. We know about the great periods of time that are all determined by the movement of the heavenly bodies that move perfectly in order, that move with precision. And that's how we get our time. Is that not right? The hour, the day, the month, the year. We live in, an, a, a, in a universe of order, of precision, of balance. And these natural laws are fixed and they are constant. For example, if I jump off this platform, where am I going to end up? I'm going to end up right on that floor, isn't that right? You're not going to say, well, well, it depends what day of the week it is. What's today? Well, it's Sunday. Well, maybe you go up today. Now we say, I know for a certainty what will happen if you jump off there. You will land on the floor. Now, ladies and gentlemen, please notice this very carefully. When we use our power of choice to disobey the laws of nature, we bring pain and suffering on ourselves. There are laws that operate our universe. And if we go against those laws, we bring harm upon ourselves. Secondly, the, un the laws of the universe are for our good. They're for our protection. And they affect good and bad alike. Let me give you an example. If I come along to a, a traffic light that's put there for my protection, isn't that right? The, the, the laws of the road are there to protect those who use the road, isn't that right? So if I come along to the traffic light and I see that the red light is showing and I say, look, I don't believe in traffic lights. They restrict my freedom. I don't like that. If I run that red light, what is likely to happen? Get a well, you get a ticket if you're, you, if, you're, if you're lucky, but worse can happen than just getting a ticket. Exactly. Consider... Our beautiful city of Sydney. I'm told that the highest part of the city is the, is the tower. Is that right? The, the Sydney Tower. Now, let's say I climb the tower or I go up on the lift um, and I jump off. What's going to happen? Well, yeah, you know what's going to happen. Now, listen, let me ask you this. If a good man goes up the tower and jumps off, a good man, what happens to him? We know what's going to happen. If a bad man goes up the tower and jumps off, what happens to him? Exactly the same. It doesn't matter whether we are good or whether we are bad. If we go against the laws of nature and the universe, we are going to harm ourselves. It doesn't matter whether we are good or bad. And friends, this is the point. Too many people break the laws of nature, the natural laws of the universe, 
and they blame God for the consequences. If I go up the Sydney Tower and jump off, can I blame God for what happens? Friends, too many people are reading the obituaries of drunken drivers, overeaters, four-pack-a-day smokers, and blaming God. My friends, the Bible tells us that God is love. God is love. And God's love is unconditional. God's love never changes. God's love searches for the needy. God's love puts others first. God's love is all-giving. Our question this afternoon was, does God care? My friends, God is love. And God, God's love equals freedom. Freedom means having the power to make a choice, to make a decision. And when God gave us the ability to make a choice as to whether we are going to follow him or reject him, when he gave us the power of choice, he took a risk. And with that risk, you remember one of the angels decided that he would rebel against God. God, remember, didn't want robots. He wanted beings who could respond to his love, beings upon which he could bestow his love. You can only have that happen when you give people the power of choice, when you give beings the power of choice. And once you give them the power of choice, you give them the the choice of whether they love you, they can choose to love you, or they can choose not to love you. Once you give them the power of choice, they can choose to be loyal, or they can choose to rebel. Does God care? Yes, he does. God is love and God took the risk. And you remember, Lucifer chose to reject God and rebel against him. Lucifer chose evil rather than love. And Lucifer, you remember, became the devil. And my friends, it is Lucifer, the fallen angel, the rebel who is responsible for for pain and suffering in our world. But God is here to meet our needs. And he has only the best of our interests at heart. Listen to what he says. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you. You want to know what God thinks about you? Here it is. He tells us. For I know that the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of what? Thoughts of peace, not thoughts of evil. Notice thoughts of peace are not evil, to give you a future and a hope. You know, friends, I know there may be times when it seems that God doesn't care. Even worse, we may think that he is against us. But we can be certain of this. We can be certain that God is working things out in our lives to give us a bright future. You know, if you have any doubt about God's thoughts for you and what he wants for you, about his love for you, then all you need to consider is what he's already done for us and be assured. Just think of this for a moment. If you were the only person who'd made a mistake on this planet, Jesus, the Son of God, would have come and paid the penalty for your mistake on Calvary's cross. If you were the only one, that's what he thinks of you. He doesn't, you know, 
You are more important to Jesus than his own life. Can you comprehend that? The God of the universe who hung the stars in space, who created this planet and all the others we see, he didn't want to spend eternity without you. And that's why he came to die on Calvary's cross so that each of us have an opportunity, even if we've made mistakes, we have a second shot at it. We can choose now to follow Jesus and have everlasting life. The Bible says, for God so loved the world. Instead of the word world there, put your name there. For God so loved Gary Kent that he gave his only begotten son. That's what God's like. That's what God's like. But friends, we have to remember that solving the problem of evil is not a quick fix. God's master plan, it involves the process of time. God has provided time and space for the results of sin to be seen in their entirety. Just think with me for a moment. If God stopped all the crime in our world, just say he put an end to it tomorrow, if he stopped all the compressor belts from breaking, all the buses from crashing, all the bullets from being fired, if he did this as he longs to do, we wouldn't really worry about sin, would we? Why should we? Why should we? We wouldn't worry about sin as he longs so to get rid of it. Friends, we have to understand, the universe has to understand. We must understand what sin and evil are really like. If we didn't see the tragic results of sin, if we didn't understand what sin and evil are really like, it's only going to raise its ugly head again. In the parable of the wheat and the, the, the tares, the wheat and the weeds, Jesus said evil must be around long enough to be seen for what it really is. What it was suggest, when it was suggested that the weeds and the tares be uprooted immediately, Jesus said, no, no, no. Wait for the harvest. Both must grow together until the harvest when they will be separated at last. Evil must be around long enough to be seen for what it really is. But my friends, Jesus, God has an answer. God has a plan. And the heart of God's plan to eradicate evil is the cross of Calvary. And on that cross, Jesus paid the penalty for sin and he defeated the power of sin. Now we know what sin is really like. Now even the angels knew, not even the angels knew, how good God really is until they saw what happened on the cross. Jesus not only died for his friends, but he died for his enemies. He died for those who were killing him. And so, friends, the cross shows us the hurt that sin has caused God. God has promised that he's going to put an end to sin and he's going to do it soon. And God doesn't want us to be part of sin any longer. And so he invites us to commit our lives to him. He loves us so much that he was prepared to die in our place. Jesus gave himself and he would rather not live than live without you because you are very special to God. You mean everything to him. And he's given everything for you. And the cross tells us that we are of infinite value to God. It tells us that God cares. He paid for you with his own life. And as I say, he's coming soon. He cares so much that he's coming to put an end to sin and pain and suffering once and for all. 
It's my prayer that each and every one of us here will be found ready to meet Jesus when he comes. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you we, that we worship a God who is love. We thank you that you love us. We thank you, dear Father, that you help us carry the pain and the suffering that we endure in this world. We thank you that you are coming soon to put an end to pain and suffering. We long for that day, and so we pray with the Apostle John, even so come, Lord Jesus. And on that wonderful day when you come as King of kings and Lord of lords, it is my prayer that each and every one of us here will be found ready and waiting to meet you. For this is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.